Christmas, everybody. Is it crazy to you that it is Christmas already? This is the week of Christmas. Now, out of curiosity, show of hands before we jump into the message today, how many of you are already done with all of your Christmas shopping, okay? Everybody look around. These are the people we all hate, right? Yeah, we hate you. Um, but there's still like three days to shop, and we are good. So it is fun. This is the Christmas season. We love Christmas. Now, we are in a series called Let Us Adore. But before we go there today, I want to just kind of honor you for just a moment. Now, I'm going to break one of my rules. Normally, when I speak, I like to come in and just jump right into the message and get to work. But this is the last Sunday that we have services this year, and I want to honor you. We've had an amazing year. In fact, 2014 will go down as one of my favorite years in the history of our church. I've just loved it. We've seen so many things, so many stories of life change. I mean, it's just been absolutely amazing. And that's because of you and because of your heart and because of the way you've served and given so generously. And so I want you to hear this from me. Thank you for making this the best year. And I believe that 2015 can be even greater than this year was. Let me tell you just a couple things because statistics kind of matter. I really believe in the power of serving. I really do. And when we serve, like when we don't just talk about loving God, but when we show it through acts of kindness and generosity and serving other people, that God blesses, like he pours his blessings out. And about a week ago, I asked Tara, I asked her, I said, do me a favor and figure out how many hours people served this year, but figure it out conservatively. You know, don't, don't like exaggerate the numbers. Conservatively, we added up the numbers and you served this year one, uh, what is it, 11,332 hours this year. This year. Isn't that unbelievable, everybody? It just is. Yeah. Like, if you do the math on it, that's 472.4 days. 472 days served that we just gave away for nothing in return, just to be a blessing and to be a part of what God is doing. I just absolutely love that. Well, your generosity goes beyond that. Tara told you just a moment ago, the Parker Street Christmas store yesterday was awesome. And we gave away 640 presents to children. 128 kids were able to buy for their families. And that's just unbelievable. It's amazing. I took my son Joey there yesterday. And um, Joey's seven. And he has a heart. For others that is just so big and we served but we can only stay for the first hour or so because my wife had an event that night and so I, I pulled him out and I was like buddy we have to leave a little bit early today I'm so sorry and he does this he goes oh. I said what he goes dad I love my job and I just love helping people and I was like oh dude I'm buying you more presents and I just love him and he just has a heart for serving and so thank you for that another really cool thing is this uh, two Sundays ago we received our annual Christmas offering and if you know anything about our church we try to be the most generous we possibly can be we give a large percentage of what comes in every month out it goes right out to meet needs in our city and our church around the world it goes to help like build churches it goes to help uh, meet needs like if you remember earlier this year we built a church in Mexico we helped give money to resource a church that's being planted in Kenya we're helping my friend Jay plant a church in Raleigh North Carolina like lots of things we do with the money that comes in but once a year we receive a special offering called the Christmas offering and that money is set aside to just be proactive when needs happen and so instead of there being a disaster or a crisis in a family in our church or something that happens that we wait and then try to receive a special offering for later we said that we want to do two things number one is we want to create the kind of church where you would feel comfortable inviting a friend because you don't feel like we're going to shake you down for money every time you come. And so that's one reason we do once a year. Secondly, we want to be able to be proactive. So when something happens, we can respond right away. And so last year, 2013, you gave like $6,200 in that offering, which is cool. Um, this year, I was praying that we would hit like nine or 10000 and you gave over $13,000 to the offering, which is unbelievable, more than double last year. So give yourself a hand. It's awesome. Yeah, and, and there's people that have still told me, Jason, we intend to give. We were just out of town or forgot or we're bringing a check. And so who knows where this number is going to land. But thank you for your generosity. We've already started giving. We've already started meeting needs. And so thank you so much for being the most generous kind of church imaginable. Beyond all that, like I'm super excited because not only is like a lot of amazing things happening and not only have you served and given so generously, but like there's another miracle happening that might be almost equal to the miracle of Christmas itself. And it is that the Dallas Cowboys might make the playoffs this year. Can I get an amen? And I didn't plan on doing this, but I have a moment. Um, so I had a bet last week on the game with my friend Stu, and um, he's an Eagles fan. I'm a Cowboys fan. And anyways, the bet was the, the loser had to change their Facebook profile picture, but that's, that's for sissies. And then um, we had to get a temporary tattoo on our lower back if you lost, and um, that will be coming for Stu, Stu soon. But then there was one other part that I just loved. Is Stu in the room this morning, Stu? Stu, hi, Stu. I love Dallas Cowboys. That's what I'm 
I'm talking about. Yeah. So, whew. I don't care what happens for the rest of the Sunday. That was worth it. So, let's do this, everybody. Let's pray, and then let's just get to work this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much uh, for the miracle that is this Christmas season. And God, it's really easy for us to get busy. It's easy for us to get distracted. It's easy to always be focused on all the things that are still to do on our to-do list. But God, in the midst of this season, in the midst of all of our busyness, I pray that we will have the courage to stand against the current of culture and we will just slow down, that we'll pause and we'll remember the beauty, like why it is that we even celebrate the special day. So Jesus, before we dive into your word today, we just want to say thank you for coming into this world, for putting on flesh and blood, for becoming man so that you could live and die and rise again for us. And so help us, God, to never forget the joy and the beauty of this season, the reason why we celebrate. In Jesus' name, amen. When my wife and I moved into the house that we currently live in, we did what every couple does when they move into a house. You start trying to find a place for everything. And so you have all these dishes and silverware and you gotta figure out what drawers and what cabinets do they go in. And then you have a closet and there's always like a fight over who gets how much closet space. And so, but there was one thing that we kind of fought about really early on when we moved into this house. Now, the master bathroom in the house is like many, it has two different sinks. And then, but there's not a lot of uh, space in drawers for you to put stuff. And so you have like two Two sinks and you have the under sink storage. And then there's one drawer in the middle of them that's about maybe two and a half feet wide. It's about this wide. It's in the middle. And we get there and we start setting our stuff up and I come into the bathroom and Liz has that whole drawer completely full. Like overflowing full. And I'm like, hold, hold up, hold up. I live here too. You know, like what is going on? And she goes, you can have under the sink. And I was like, I don't want, no man wants under the sink. I just want a little space. Can I get a little space in this drawer? And we talked about it. We discussed it. We fought about it a little bit. And finally, I fought for what I knew was right. And I said, all I want is about six or seven inches of space in this drawer. The, the drawer is like two and a half feet wide. All I'm looking for is this much space. Is there any man in the room that can identify with where I'm going right now? Anybody? Oh, man, I just felt God in this room. And so... All I wanted was like this much space, right? So no big deal. So we say we agree to it. I have this much space. I keep my stuff on my side of the drawer where my stuff is. I don't have much stuff. I'm a dude. Like all I need is some deodorant and something to put in my hair. You know, I just need a little space right here. And so we fought about it. I finally got this much space for myself and it was great. Like I had my space. She had her rest of the drawer. We had this worked out. But over time, something happened. Over time, her stuff began to creep all up into my side. And I'm, I'm looking for my deodorant, but I got to like move makeup. I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm looking for a Q-tip, but I got to move some kind of cream you put on your face. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm looking for my stuff, but all of my stuff, slowly her stuff just grew and multiplied and spread and grew legs and crawled up onto my space. And so I did what any good husband would do. I said, baby, look, I just, all I need is like six or seven inches right here. I just need my space right here. That's all that I need. And she's like, oh, no problem, whatever. And then she would never do anything about it. And pretty soon her stuff kept creeping up into my space. And then it like day after day turned into week after week of my space. I just, my deodorant doesn't want to touch makeup. That's how I live. You know what I'm saying? And like, and so I fought for it, nothing happened. And then one day, I just, I had to get a message across. Like one day, I needed to explain to her that this situation wasn't okay. Like it is not okay for your stuff to touch my stuff in the drawer. Like we share a drawer, we got it, but I just need some space. So what I did was brilliant. I went outside and I got a yardstick and I broke it in half to create a wall, right? I just needed a wall here to divide your line from my line. That's all I needed. But then she still wasn't getting the message. And so one day I tried to send a message and here's what I did. I went into Joey's room and I got these green army men and <laughs> and I set them up now this was awesome and I I set it up and I waited I just put it there and I didn't do anything I just wanted to see if she would ever catch on I wanted to see if she would ever respond and I didn't know when she saw it until my phone buzzed because I had an alert that she had tweeted and when she tweeted she, she tagged me in the tweet and here is what her tweet said. So at I am Jason Burns, which if you're looking for a good follow, there's one. So I am Jason Burns and I share a bathroom drawer. He constantly tells me that I'm hogging the whole thing. Tonight, he finally cracks. <laughs> This thing, for what it's worth, kind of blew up the internet for a little bit. Uh, it was just funny. It was funny to me because um, men were commenting like, hold your ground, Jason. This, this is for all of humanity, you know. Very fun, over-dramatized. But this, 
This was my moment, like I had to get a message across. I had said things over and over and over again, but the message wasn't getting across, and I just had to do something dramatic in the moment that got the message across. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now, in some weird, strange, unique kind of way, this is the Christmas story. It is. That your heavenly Father has been trying so much to speak to you and to speak to your family and your friends. And for generations, your heavenly father has been trying to speak, has been trying to speak words of life over you, to breathe life into you. He's been trying to have a conversation with all of humanity. The problem is we get distracted. We get busy. We have things to do. We have information that we need to read about on Twitter. We have statuses that we need to update. We have things we need to check out. But who's dating who in celebrity world? Like there are things that we just need to know all the time. So what happens to you and what happens to me is your heavenly father is speaking over you, but you get so busy and you get so distracted. A couple of nights ago, um, I had bought this gingerbread house and it was so fun because I had decided with my boys that we were going to decorate a gingerbread house together. And for the last few years, my wife and Tara have done one together and they're both like artistic and they make this beautiful thing. My boys and I took it and we just made this beautiful mess together. It was amazing. And it was funny because I put the icing all on first and then the boys' responsibility was to put all the candy on the gingerbread house as well. Now, in my family, we are a little tiny bit sexist in that like we, everything that can be manly, we try to make manly. And so we didn't call it a gingerbread house. We called it a ginger man house. It was just fun. And so the boys decorate it. And at one point I thought, I'm going to take a picture of this. And so I can send it to Liz and Tara and send it to some friends. And so I took a picture on the phone and then I got distracted and then I found myself on Twitter, and then I thought, well, I might as well check Facebook and then see what's going on in my emails. And then I had an email that I had to respond to, and one thing led to another. And at one point, I kind of came to with my son Joey sitting to my right saying, Dad, Dad, <laughs> hey, Dad, 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 look at this, Dad, Dad. And it's like I finally snapped into it and realized he's been trying to get my attention for 15, 20 seconds. Like I was there with him. I was in this beautiful moment there, but I wasn't with him. You understand what I'm saying? I was there physically, but mentally I was just completely checked out of the moment. And this again is the story of Christmas of your heavenly father trying to get your attention, trying to wake you up from your sleep, trying to get you out of this days of life to speak over you words of life, words of healing, words of hope. And so often we're just so distracted. We have all these voices that are competing for our attention. And so the Christmas story is God finding a way, like me with the drawer in the army men, to captivate our attention, to focus our eyes for just a moment, instead of focusing on all the random things that are competing for our attention, to silence all the random voices that are competing for space in our heads. The Christmas story is God saying to humanity, I have to do something huge to get your attention. I have to do something bold for you to see what I'm trying to say to all of humanity. And that is the story of Christmas. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We'll get there in a few minutes. But Luke chapter 2 is what we're going to read from today. And to help us understand this before we go there, I want to kind of talk for a moment about the Christmas story. Do this for me, okay? At some point or another, most of us, probably all of us, have heard at least a part of the Christmas story. And the Christmas story is loaded with all these amazing subplots that come together to form this beautiful story. You have Joseph and Mary each having an encounter with an angel of God saying that you are going to have a child. And they're like, wait, wait how could we, we haven't even, how, how could this even possibly be? And so they, they trust him. And then, and then there's this, this scene where there are these magi, these wise men, who they, they follow a star because they just know that they have to respond in some kind of way to bring a gift to their savior. And then there are these shepherds and the shepherds are just fascinating to me for a host of reasons. Now, often when we read the biblical narrative, there's one of two things happening. Either we've heard it so many times that it just kind of becomes white noise in the backdrop of our life, or we've over cartoonized it. We've over fantasized it and made it into kind of like a, a silly fairy tale kind of story. What you need to understand is that this is a real story of real things that are happening. One of the things you need to know is this, the shepherds in the Bible that we read about what you need to know about them is they probably don't meet the picture you have in your mind. Often we think of a couple dudes sitting out in the countryside in bathrobes, having a drink, watching sheep, like fluffy, fluffy sheep. But these, these were like outcasts of society. 
Shepherds were looked down upon. It was kind of like one of the lowest jobs you could have. And offered a shepherd would be ostracized by their community. They wouldn't live where the people were. They would actually live with the sheep. And so you think about these people, and they are kind of the lowest of low on the totem pole of society. They have no real relationships because they live ostracized. They are viewed and looked down upon. And these are the people that God chooses to show up to, to tell the story of hope that is going to happen. Now, this whole story is happening, and often we sing songs like the song that Joel just beautifully played a moment ago, Silent Night. And we think about this song, and the song is beautiful and poetic, but it's probably historically completely inaccurate because there was probably nothing silent about the night Jesus was born. It was chaotic. The world was ruled and run by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was oppressive of people. And at one point they got this idea, we need to have a census so we know how many people are actually living so we can have a head count of what's going on here in in our empire. And so they tell people, you have to go back to your home of origin. And so Mary and Joseph, late into their pregnancy, trek across this land to go back to this city. They finally get to this city and there they have this baby. But if you know the story, you know that there was no place for them to stay. The whole place was filled up with travelers coming back to their hometown. So they end up having this baby in a manger, basically in the back, like in a garage or a farm that would have been dirty and covered with animals. Now, a little side note. The song Silent Night to me has always kind of been a little silly because if you've ever been in the room when a person is having a baby... Um, there is nothing silent about it. Like, there's screaming, there's yelling, a couple curse words maybe. There's just like things that happen in this moment. And so Mary is in this dirty place and she's having a baby. There's animals around. There's nothing silent about this moment. And this is the story that God chooses to write. Now, before we go to the scripture, I want to ask you a question. If you were God and you were going to do what, you were going to send your son Jesus to do what he did, how would you do it? You could send him to be the son of the most powerful ruler in the world. You could send him to be the child of the pop, most popular celebrity couple. You, you could send him to a family with great wealth. You could send him to a family with great fame. You could send him to any family you want. You could create a massive ordeal about it, or you could send him to an unsuspected teen mom You could have her have to travel to a place to give birth in the most obscure, unobvious place imaginable. And God chooses this. Now, now why do you think this is? Before we answer that question, let's go to the scriptures and let's see what it has to say. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8 today. It says this. It says in this, it says, and there were shepherds, and we talked about shepherds, outcasts, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And I just hope to take this story and shed some light on it. It's interesting because it says this, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. So these are the outcasts. This is what they do with their life. This is where they live. They don't like go work nine to five with the sheep and then come home at night. They live here. And God, in all of his wisdom, chooses to show up to them, the outcasts. Those who felt meaningless, probably those who felt like their life was worthless. And as a little subtrack here for just a moment, I really feel like if you feel in any way like that is your story, like you may live in a house in a city, but the truth is you feel like an outcast. You feel disconnected relationally. You feel like no one notices you, no one cares about you. I just want to say to you, this, the Christmas story, first of all, reveals that your heavenly father looks out for everyone, including those who feel the most down and out. It says there were shepherds that were living out in the fields nearby, keeping over their sheep at night. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now I want to talk for here just a moment about this word glory. Glory is a word that we use in church often. We'll sing it in songs. It's loaded in a lot of different Christmas songs. But the word glory is a word that if you don't fully understand it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. The word glory here, it comes from a Greek word. The word is kabod. Kabod is a fun word to say. It feels like something you would order at like a, like a Turkish restaurant. Give me a kabod. But that, that's the word there. The word is kabod. And the word kabod literally translated in English, the best way we possibly can means this. It means the full weight of God's presence. It means the full weight of God's presence. So there are these shepherds, the outcast of society, and they have this moment where they're interrupted by God. 
And it says these angels show up, the angel of the Lord appears to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. That means that the angels appear to them, and all of a sudden something happens. All of a sudden there is this moment where God says, I'm creating a moment so that I can speak to you. I'm creating space here and now so that I can talk to you. Like I have to do something to interrupt you from your regularly scheduled program so that I can get your attention. This is God's army men and a yardstick. This is God's moment where he says, I want you to experience something. Now, before I go any farther, let me tell you something. This is something I pray over all of you all the time, and you just don't know it. Like, I pray all the time that you will have an encounter with God, an experience with God, that you will have a moment with God. Maybe for some of you that moment is today, but I pray you'll have a moment with God where you just feel the weight of who he is. You experience him, and then he speaks to you. Now, the truth is, there are so many people that say things like, well, you know, God never speaks t- to me. Like, like, I've prayed before and I want God to speak to me, but God never r- really speaks to me. Well, maybe it is possible that you've just missed the moments that God has had for you all along. The Bible is a story, it's a narrative full of times where God interrupts someone's life so that he can speak to them, so that he can forever redirect the course of their life. Think about Moses in the Old Testament. Moses was born into royalty through a whole amazing series of miracles. And he's raised in the palace of the king. He makes a bad decision as kind of a youth, kills a man, and instead of standing up for himself and like, and, and like fighting and just dealing with the consequences, he runs for his life. And he runs into the wilderness, into this place of nothingness. We find out later in the book of Acts that he spent 40 years wandering in this wilderness and he makes his way there into this wilderness and all of a sudden God interrupts him. There's this bush that's on fire. And it's like God uses these moments of divine interruption so he can speak to us here and now. And I would say this to some of you. I believe that there are some of you that you know on some level that God has been trying to get your attention and you've just kind of written it off as oh, that's just coincidence. Oh, that, that can't be. That's just something weird that happened and you know it. You know it's true. Like you've had these divine moments, these divine encounters with God and it's happened over and over and over for you but instead of leaning into them and instead of trusting God in these circumstances, you've just kind of said that can't really possibly be true but here's what you find in the Christmas story. In these divine moments, in these moments of glory, these moments of kabod where God interrupts you and interrupts your life, there he speaks. And so the people, these shepherds are out there, verse nine again, it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them in the glory, the full weight of who God is, shone around them. And it says, and they were terrified. I think that's like the understatement of the Bible, right? They were just freaked out by this moment. So there's this divine moment. Now God begins to speak through the angel. It says, verse 10, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring to you good news. And I actually think that this phrase from verse 10 is really one of the central narratives of the whole Bible. And in fact, if you're a person who struggles with anxiety, if you're a person that struggles with fear, if you're a person that struggles with worry, if you feel like there are things around you that you want to control but you can't control and that keeps you up at night, the Christmas story should be so liberating for you. It it really should because when God shows up, when you have an encounter with God, often the first thing God says is, do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It says this, verse 11. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. This is the Christmas story. So then what the angels say to these shepherds is like, you don't have to be afraid. You're experiencing a moment. Now God's going to speak to you. But here's the reason. There's the message. Today, there's been a savior born to you. Essentially, what he says is today for you, for those of you who feel lost, who feel like a person adrift at sea, trying, struggling to eke out an existence in your life, for those of you who feel like your life feels meaningless and it has no point to it, for those of you that need help, God didn't send a helper. God didn't send more rules. He didn't send a playbook of all the plays you have to run. God didn't send a coach or a consultant. He didn't send a helper. He didn't send a spiritual advisor. What God sent for you, for me, for the shepherds, for all of humanity is a savior. Now what I love about the Christmas story is this. In the Christmas story, we meet all of these different figures, real people that lived just 2,000 years ago. We meet Mary and Joseph, they obey. 
We meet shepherds and they have this encounter with God. We, we meet King Herod and he is terrified and he rules by fear. We meet the wise men. We meet all different kinds of people. And every single one of them has this moment. They have this encounter, this divine interruption from God and it gives all of them a choice. What do I do? The truth is all of us have these moments happen all the time to us. Moments where you can choose to stand up for someone else. You can provide justice in a moment of injustice. We have moments where God provides us the opportunity to be a blessing, to leverage our life, to give, to serve, to do something with it. All of us have had these moments where it felt like, man, this is more than coincidence. Like this is a special place because God is here with us. And then we have a choice now as a result, how do I respond? I think my favorite song in the Christmas season is the song, Oh Come All Ye Faithful. The, the words of the song or the song is a song you know. It says, oh come, let us adore him. And last night, I looked up the word adore. And it was funny because when I looked up the word adore, a bunch of different definitions came up. The first one is to magnify, to make something great. That's where the series started that we are to magnify God, which makes him great. It makes him bigger than all of our problems, all of our frustration, all of our fear, all of our stress, all of our anxiety. When we magnify him, it makes everything else seem smaller in comparison. So adore means to magnify. It also means to exalt, to fully surrender, to give total control to. The problem with words is that words over time get hijacked. At one point, bad meant bad. Another time, bad meant good. I don't know what bad means anymore, right? Um, other words get hijacked. Um, the word adore has been hijacked. It's, it's been hijacked by the ditzy celebrity people that I adore this purse. I adore your shoes. But I think that adoring something should have reverence attached to it. And all of these people in the Christmas story have a moment where they have to choose, what will I adore? What will I surrender to? What will I give my life to? What will I turn my focus on? And here's the answer. What you put your focus on reveals what you worship. Where your focus is reveals what you worship. And all of us worship something or someone. We just do. And if you don't know what you worship, I would just challenge you to look at your schedule from the last week. Look at the things you did and the things you accomplished because that kind of reveals what you adore, where you put your time, your energy, and your money. It reveals where your heart is. And the beauty of the Christmas season is this, is God interrupts everything, all of our busyness to say, okay, I've got your attention now. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now the question becomes, how do you respond? This week, um, I was on Facebook for a moment and I saw someone post a picture. And I'm gonna be honest, um, I, I bite my tongue or I, I bite my fingers instead of responding often on Facebook because I think there are some Christians who are well intending that say things that I'm just like, do you want anyone else to follow Jesus? Because you make us look like idiots, right? And this person put up a post and I got the heart behind it. It was, just, it was very condescending. It was, it was a circle, it was a clock. And every hour on the clock was a different icon from something. It was Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It was television and computer and a phone. And just like all these things that we give our time to, all things that are not necessarily good or bad, they're just kind of neutral. There are all these things. And then the comment was something like, you say you don't have time for anything, look at your time, how you spend it. And I got the heart of it. It was very condescending the way it was written, the way it was designed. But the point is this, where you invest your time reveals what's in your heart. It reveals the things that you worship. And at the Christmas season, you are given a choice. It's like there is this line drawn in the sand of what will I choose to turn my focus to? Now, now there's been a line drawn and you have to make the decision, will I fully surrender my life? Will I wholeheartedly seek after the things of God? 
But will I surrender my life to Jesus when I come to church? Will I give my all? Will I serve? Will I give? Will I love with everything I have? Will I do these things? Or will I just see there's a line in the sand and maybe someday that'll be for me, but I'm going to choose to live my life for me. The beauty of the Christmas story is this, is that your heavenly father could have sent a list of rules. He could have sent another 10 commandments and said, if you don't follow these, you don't get into heaven. If you follow these, you're in the club. He could have done that. But God knew what we all know, which is that no matter how hard you try, you're not good enough to measure up to God's level of holiness. You're not. God could have spent, sent a coach, someone to like help you figure things out. God could have sent pastors or teachers or lawyers or someone to like argue on your behalf. But what God knew that all of us needed wasn't more rules, it wasn't more regulations, it wasn't just someone to come along and help us. What humanity needed when we were adrift on our own, unable to save ourselves, was humanity needed a savior. So God interrupts the course of human history. Every moment from this point on, it's like time was forever split. And God interrupts human history to say, I've got something for you. It's not more rules. You can't handle the rules you've already got. It's not someone else to teach you something. It's not more regulations. It's none of those things. I'm sending you a lifeline. You and I need a savior. So this Christmas, I want to ask this question. What do you focus on? This Christmas season, where does your heart go when you're kind of bored and don't really have anything to do? This Christmas season, in the midst of the busyness, which is fun in many ways, where is your focus? Because your focus reveals what you worship. Here's the point. At Christmas, we're reminded that our Heavenly Father, God Himself, loved humanity. He loved you and me so much that he would choose to send his son to die for us, to live in this world, to die, so that we could be close to him. Now, now what kind of person does that? Okay. A person who loves you unconditionally. So I don't know where you find yourself in the Christmas story. Maybe you've just sold out, you're fully devoted to God, you love him with everything you have. And Christmas is just a reminder of how great you have it because of his great love for you. Maybe, maybe you're like the shepherds and you feel adrift. You feel lost, you feel separated from your heavenly father. You feel like an outcast to God and you feel like an outcast to society. And the Christmas story, the story of the shepherds reminds us that no matter how far you feel away from everything, that your heavenly father is a breath away and he's watching you and he cares for you. Maybe you're a person who's just, you just kind of always run from it. The Christmas story is just a beautiful story just to get to the presence, but really none of it matters to you. And maybe for once, you'll stop ignoring all the signs. You'll stop ignoring all the things that feel coincidental because God has interrupted you so that he could scream to you, I love you. What if this Christmas season was different for all of us because we have a savior, a line's been drawn, and now we have to choose where do I focus my worship? I just know this. I know that in all of the busyness and all the stress of life, not just the Christmas season, you and I have this opportunity. We can focus our attention downward on all of our problems, or we can come to God and focus on Him, magnify, exalt, check this out, adore Him, worship Him, and watch what happens from there. In a moment, we're gonna end the service a little unique. Um, this is the Christmas season. In a moment, we're gonna come forward and we're gonna receive communion together. And communion is typically kind of designated to be times when we think about Jesus' death. Like Jesus came and died on the cross to pay the price for our sins and he rose again from the dead so we could experience life in God. And all of that is true. But Christmas is also about just remembering the great sacrifice that he made for us. I don't know if you've ever thought about the Christmas story from God's perspective but God turned to his son and said, I love you. Go into the world to pay the price ultimately for humanity. Strip yourself of all of your godliness for a moment. Step into the world 
so you can live and die. Christmas, we remember Jesus who gave ultimately for us so that we could experience life in him. Here's how we're gonna do this. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray for you. The Bible says this, there is an unholy, un, that incorrect way to take communion. And that is if you're not in right standing with God. If you've never made the decision to commit your life to him, if you've ignored all the signs that he's real and that he loves you and he pursues you, if you've ignored all the signs, but today you don't wanna play any games, you just wanna get right with God in a moment, we're gonna pray. Then we're all gonna take communion together. Would you do this with me all across this room? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm gonna pray for us. And then maybe you're here and you just need to experience this moment where you surrender all of you to Jesus. I'm gonna pray, then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. Let me pray now. Father, I thank you so much for your unbelievable, undeniable, beautiful love for us. And God, you could have said, I love you a thousand different ways, but you didn't just say it, you demonstrated it. It, you showed that love isn't love unless there's action associated with it. And so Jesus, you came and you were born as a baby into this world that so desperately needed you. Yet you were light in a world that seemed so dark. And you came so that you could live and so that you could give yourself for all of us. And God, I thank you that because Jesus came and lived, there was a line drawn forever in the sand of time that for once and for all, we got to determine where we would turn our focus. So God, I pray that this Christmas season, you'll give us the courage to turn our focus, our attention, our heart towards you. God, we thank you for that. Now, if you're here, with your head's still bowed and your eyes still closed, and you know that you're not in right standing with God. Maybe you prayed a prayer, but you were a kid. You just committed your life to God, but you've run so far from him. Or maybe you're like so many Americans and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, but today you'd like to. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you, just say, Jason, that's me. Just raise your hand right now and I'm gonna include you in this prayer when we pray. Thank you. Jason, this is me. Thank you right there. Jason, this is me. Thank you. Several people have responded. And in this moment, in this Christmas season, I'm gonna pray with you and I'm gonna ask you to just repeat these words after me. And praying a prayer doesn't make you a Christian, but what does is surrendering your life to Jesus. So would you just pray this after me? God, I thank you that you love me so much that you did the unthinkable for me. You sent Jesus, your perfect son, to be born, to live, to die, to rise again from the dead, to be the payment for the, the sin that I have. So Jesus, today I make this choice. I receive the gift of life that you so freely offer. I receive salvation through you. I surrender my life to you. I give all of me to you. And Jesus, from this day on, I'll live my life for you. I thank you, Jesus, that this Christmas is going to be different because you've saved me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you're my savior. And from this day on, I give my life to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, we just had quite a few people respond. Can we celebrate that together, everybody? I love it. Love it.